Greetings all and welcome to Lecture 2 Part 1. In Lecture 1 we saw how a complex mix of factors had ended the medieval period and ushered in the early modern era. The Age of Discovery, which included the discovery of the American continents by Europeans, the circumnavigation of the globe, and the establishment of colonies around the world by Europeans had extreme and far-reaching consequences, as we have seen, such as the globalization of empire and social revolutions caused by new technologies and ideas. In Europe, the Renaissance, the rediscovery of the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome, and the application of reason to questions of physical science and philosophy created scientific and artistic revolutions and new ways of organizing society, many of which remain with us today. One of the most fundamental and revolutionary of the consequences of the voyages of discovery was a cultural interaction called the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange was the exchange of a vast array of plants, animals, culture, ethnicities, technology, and diseases between Europeans and the people of the Americas. This exchange had profound consequences and touched the lives of every person on both sides of the Atlantic. Plants that had never been seen in Europe before, like potatoes and tobacco, rapidly became staples in European diets and popular commodities. Animals previously unknown in the Americas, like horses and sheep, remade native cultures and economies. And of course, European d diseases decimated native populations, depopulating entire regions, creating a death toll among native tribes that exceeded 90%, and in absolute numbers, probably exceeded even the death toll of the Black Death that ravaged Europe from 1348 to 1350 and contributed to the end of the medieval period. While smallpox was probably the most deadly of the diseases Europeans exposed the native populations to, it was not the only one by far. Among them was yellow fever, which was imported into the Americas from Africa through one of the most fundamental structures of the European colonial empires, the traffic in enslaved African peoples. Shortly after a Portuguese shipwreck had introduced firearms to feudal Japan, another Portuguese ship in 1526 landed at the Portuguese, Portuguese colony of Brazil, becoming the first ship known to have engaged in the Atlantic slave trade. In subsequent centuries, every European empire engaged in the slave trade, and the labor of enslaved peoples was fundamental to the economies of the colonies especially among the tropical plantations of South America and the Caribbean islands dedicated to producing a commodity that was exploding in popularity and sweeping Europe, sugar. Demand for sugar was rapidly increasing, driving up value and making some sugar producers very wealthy. Sugar would ultimately become one of the financial bases of the European colonial empires in the Americas, and its profitable production was directly dependent on the availability of a nearly inexhaustible supply of labor supplied by, supplied by enslaved peoples. While South America and the Caribbean were the most direct of directly affected by this phase of the Atlantic slave trade, the second order effects supported a wide variety of industries across the empire, such as shipbuilders, marine supplies, wholesalers, banks, business investment, speculation. Over time, the industry evolved into a three-faceted system. British ships would depart Britain for Africa. There they would exchange the textiles and firearms they had brought for enslaved people. Then the ships would sail for the slave ports of Brazil or the Caribbean, where the human cargo that had survived the brutal crossing of the Atlantic would be sold at a huge markup. Some or all of this profit would then be used to load the ship up with as much sugar or other agricultural products as possible for the trip back to Britain, where the cargo would again be sold at a large profit margin and the initial investors and underwriters paid. Firearms played an important role in the entrenchment of the Atlantic slave trade in Africa. Firearms were important force multipliers for African warlords and state armies and made the force which had them into important regional military powers, so the demand for firearms among elites in Africa was intense and ongoing. 
the only source African elites could obtain firearms from were Europeans, and the Europeans wanted enslaved people to take to the Americas. In this way, then, the Atlantic slave trade made African leaders dependent on it for their power and thoroughly militarized African societies. The logical endpoint of this process could be seen in such, such states as Ashanti, which waged war against all of its neighboring states for the specific purpose of capturing people that could then be traded to the Europeans. The economics of the Atlantic slave trade reveal why the slave trade persisted for so long. The short answer is profitability. The slave trade was fantastically profitable with an average return of an, on investment factor of 30, a prof profitability ratio matched only by the modern drug trade, but without the added expense of being illegal. An enslaved person could be sold in the slave markets of the Americas for 30 times what it costs to purchase them. This pro profitability factor also reveals why conditions on the slave ships were so brutal. Let's look at an example. If a slave trader purchases a hundred people for five dollars a piece in Africa and can sell them for a hundred and fifty dollars a piece in America, the slave trader can break even if only four of the people on the ship survive all the way to the market. So there was every economic incentive to pack the ships as tightly as possible to disregard the health and safety of the people being transported. Over time, about 20% of those taken on board slave ships bound for the Americas died before arrival. The labor of enslaved peoples would remain integral to the economies of the region for approximately 350 years. Slavery would not be abolished in Brazil until 1888. While colonial empires powered by the slave trade expanded abroad, in Europe the Renaissance was taking hold, first in Italy and then spreading to the rest of Europe. Historians argue about when the Renaissance actually began. As with the end of the medieval period, there was a complex mix of causes spanning more than a century. Certainly, the rediscovery of the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome is an essential element. While much specific knowledge of classical civilization had disappeared in Western Europe, the continuing existence of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, for another thousand years after the fall of Rome had preserved this knowledge. Likewise, after Islam had emerged and assimilated many of the lands previously held by Rome in the East, the scholars of the great Islamic University at Baghdad and other centers of learning in the Islamic Golden Age had absorbed this information, critiqued it, and scaffolded scholarship on top of it. Some of this knowledge, along with luxury items and other consumer products, began to filter back to Europe as a result of the Crusades. Later, scholars fleeing the fall of Constantinople in 1453 also took up residence in Italy. Also in Italy, Dante Alighieri, writing in the vernacular style of the common people instead of the Latin common to the elites, wrote one of the most important works of this transitional period, The Divine Comedy, published in 1320. Dante's exploration of heaven and hell in the comedy provided imagery for centuries of Western concepts of religious ideas and standardized the Italian language, similar to the way Shakespeare would standardize English two and a half centuries later. Among Dante's friends, was a merchant named Ser Petraco. In 1304, Ser's wife Eletta gave birth to a son, Francesco Petraco. However, the world remembers him better by his Latinized name, Petrarch. Petrarch was a scholar, a traveler, and a prolific writer. He traveled widely and collected Latin manuscripts wherever he could. In 1345, he personally discovered a collection of the writings of the Roman statesman Cicero, now considered among the best primary sources on the period immediately preceding the fall of the, of the Roman Republic. For his efforts in locating Greek and Roman documents and translating them, for encouraging their study by others, and for spreading the ideas contained therein, such as the thoughts of the Greek philosopher Protagoras, who famously said, Man is the measure of all things. Petrarch is widely considered the father of humanism. 
the dominant philosophical movement of the Renaissance, which places humans and human concerns above all else. His advocacy and promotion of these ideas also earned him the title, the Father of the Renaissance. The Renaissance covered a wide range of human activity, including art, science, politics, economics, and philosophy. It began in Italy, in Florence, and then spread to the rest of Europe. It began in Florence for a variety of reasons. The end of feudalism and the Black Death had seen the rise of a middle class, and the emergence of a broad-based market for artistic creations and productions had followed. An unusual degree of political freedom gave space to those pushing the boundaries, and the patronage of competing rich families subsidized the creation of countless works of public art. The most noteworthy of these families were the Medicis and the Borgias. The Medici family had prospered in the textile trade before opening what has to be considered the first modern bank, the Medici Bank. In creating the bank, Cosimo de' Medici developed several inno innovations, such as double-entry bookkeeping, which remain fundamental in bookkeeping to the present. The Medici Bank had also found a method of bypassing the church's prohibition on charging compound interest through adding in the charges and letters of credit across national lines, without which modern banking could not exist. The Medici family also produced four popes, Leo X, Clement VII, Pius IV, and Leo XI, and two queens of France. During the years of their preeminence, the Medici financed, among other things, operas, the invention of the piano, the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, and at various times were the patrons of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Machiavelli, and Galileo. Among the most notorious of the rivals of the Medici were the Borgia family. The Borgia family had originated in Spain before coming to Italy when Alphonse de Borgia was elected Pope in 1455. Alphonse appointed his nephew Rodrigo to the College of Cardinals. Rodrigo would later be elected Pope in 1492 as Pope Alexander VI. Alexander is remembered as one of the most controver controversial popes of all. During his papacy, he fathered four children and went to great lengths to enrich both himself and his extended family and appointed family members to high positions in the government, the church, and the papal army. He was widely criticized for lavish spending and corruption, including the sale of so-called indulgences in which a penitent could pay the church for the forgiveness of his sins on simony or the sale of church offices. Many of these offenses would later become the grounds upon which German cleric Martin Luther would base his 95 theses, his demands for church reform that Luther famously nailed to the door of the church in Wittenberg in 1517, the opening movement to reform the church called the Reformation. The glorification of the human at the center of humanism created an image of the ideal person, the so-called universal, universal man, which in Renaissance thought recognized no limits on human potential. Examples of this school of thought are among some of the most accomplished and successful polymaths ever. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, for example, made significant contributions in painting, sculpture, architecture, philosophy, biology, geology, physics, and engineering. Michelangelo, the sculptor of David and painter of the Sistine Chapel, was also an excellent architect as well as a gifted poet and writer. Galileo Galilei made significant contributions across a wide cross-section of physical sciences, including astronomy, physics, and material science. Galileo standardized and documented his exter experimental processes so that other scientists could replicate his experiments, and wrote voluminously on scientific topics for all of his life. He was a subscriber to the arguments of Copernicus, who had first introduced heliocentric theory, or the idea that the earth revolves around the sun. Galileo's advocacy for and defense of these ideas ultimately led him into conflict with the church, and one of the most famous conflicts of all between religion and science. Galileo had already been admonished by the Inquisition not to speak of or defend these ideas, and had complied for ten years. However, 
Galileo ultimately wrote of the theory, and in the resulting trial, Galileo was forced to recant his theory on penalty of death. After recanting, he was still held on house arrest till near the, the very end of his life. He is a profoundly influential person, still considered by many to be the father of science. At the same time, he is often credited too much. While Galileo documented his methods very well, he was not the first to use the scientific method even in his own time. Science had been expressed as math for centuries before Galileo, nor was he the first to use a telescope, although he was the first to correctly identify the moons of Jupiter. So why has he gained a reputation as the father of science and the father of physics? Partly because, as noted above, his central role in the early modern controversy over heliocentrism has made him this mythical hero figure. It's also because he was an excellent writer and self-publicist. The works of Johann Kepler, who correctly described elliptical planetary orbits, are famously difficult for modern readers, even modern astronomers. But Galileo's prose is clear and comprehensible. Consequently, for centuries he was more read by more people than any of his contemporaries. Finally, popular history still likes the 19th century concept of the great man, the towering figure who appears from nowhere and changes everything, and advancing the course of human progress. The world doesn't really work that way, but the great man narrative makes for a simpler story and is easier to tell than the, the more nuanced, complex, and messy reality, and frequently serves to reinforce existing ideas about the allocation of power in society. Galileo was a remarkable early scientist and a great and significant figure in the history of science. But he was not the father of modern science, nor was he many of the other things he has claimed to be. Renaissance art embodies some of the most enduring and universally adopted stylistic highlights in all of art history. The principles of Renaissance art are balance, symmetry, harmony, and perfection. The composition of Renaissance painting is pyramidal, that is, with the subject rising to a taper in the top center and the background symmetrical and balanced. The philosophic underpinnings are humanist, which glorify humanity even when the topic is religious. This is seen in Michelangelo's La Pieta, in which Mary holds the broken body of Christ. Of Christ. Through a sacred, though a sacred subject, the human body of Christ is rendered with fantastic realism and humanity. The values of the Renaissance affected every type of art. The literature became less religious and more secular, as illustrated by the Decameron, written by Petrarch's friend Boccaccio, a collection of stories about people fleeing the Black Death. Stories vary from the grim to the com comedic to the body, which would never have been permitted previously under church administration. Likewise, Renaissance literature was often written in the vernacular of the common people instead of the formal Latin of the church. Further, the invention of the printing press by Johann Gutenberg in 1440 made it possible for written works to reach more people than ever before, and literacy increased drastically. In architecture, building design was based on so-called perfect shapes, combinations of basic geometric shapes combining squares, rectangles, circles, and triangles, and balanced pyramidal designs to create some of the most beautiful buildings ever built. The revolution also extended to painting. The invention of linear perspective, which created the illusion of three dimensions, was joined by shading and shadowing called chiaroscuro, and the technique of layering paint to create the illusion of depth without borders called sfumato. Sfumato is most famously seen in Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Sculpture also embraced the Renaissance values of harmony, balance, and perfection. The return to the classical values was first announced by the sculptor Donatello, who cast the first large-scale nude statue since Rome. His version of David, cast in bronze, also embodies a technique characteristic of Renaissance sculpture, contrapposto, where the subject bears his weight on one leg, shaping the body into an S-curve with the pelvis twisted one way and the shoulders another. 
The pose is most famously seen in Michelangelo's magnificent statue David, carved from a single block of marble between 1501 and 1504. Renaissance-era philosophy has a profound and continuing influence on philosophy today as well. The first philosopher of note during this period was Thomas Aquinas, a Roman Catholic priest and scholar who wrote a book called the Summa Theologica, or the Summary of Theology. It was intended as a manual of the main theological teachings of the time. It summarizes the reasoning for almost all points of Christian theology in the West, which before the Protestant Reformation resided solely in the Roman Catholic Church. The Summa's topics follow a cycle the existence of God, God's creation, man, man's purpose, Christ, the sacraments, and back to God. It is most famous for its five arguments for the existence of God. The Summa brought together the logic of Aristotle with the study of the Muslims, Augustine, Jewish tradition, as well as Catholic scholarship. Aquinas believed that truth was discoverable by reason and is considered by many Catholics to be the church's greatest theologian and philosopher. In 1880, Thomas Aquinas was declared the patron of all Catholic educational establishments. Another Renaissance philosopher was, Ma was Machiavelli, known as the father of political science. Machiavelli's most famous work was The Prince, a guidebook to rulers on how to rule and how to maintain their power. In The Prince, Machiavelli wrote, Force and prudence are the might of all the governments that ever have been or will be in the world. To re retain power, the prince must maintain the institutions to which the people are accustomed, requires the prince being a public figure above reproach, while privately acting amorally to achieve state goals. The book stresses the need for brutality and fear. Quote, it is better for the prince to be feared than to be loved. End quote. In the end, the primary theme of the prince is the end justifies the means, the end being the maintenance and extension of the prince's rule. The end justifies the means without regard to rules, laws, morals, principles, or religious belief. It created a controversy when published, and such said controversy continues to this day. Christine de Passant was another Renaissance-era writer and one of the first feminists in the Western tra tradition. Of her 41 books, the most famous is The Book of the City of Ladies. In it, she defends women by collecting a wide array of famous women from throughout history. These women live in the City of Ladies, which is actually de Passant's book. As she builds her city, she uses each woman as a building block for not only the walls and houses of the city, but also as building blocks for her defense of female rights. Each woman added to the city adds to Christine's argument towards women as active participants in society. She also advocates for female and male equality within the realm of education. Another significant thinker in this period was Thomas More. More was a lawyer and a scholar. His most famous work, Utopia, laid out his vision of the structure of a perfect society. The work was created controversy due to its promotion of values seemingly at odds with a devout Catholic like More himself. Divorce, communism, religious tolerance, female priests. Later, King Henry VIII would seek to split the English church from the Catholic church because the Pope refused to annul his marriage. More, a devout Catholic, resisted the king's plans so much that Henry had him imprisoned and eventually executed. René Descartes, another important Renaissance-era philosopher, was a French writer, philosopher, and mathematician and physicist. He is considered both the father of analytic geometry and the father of modern philosophy. As much of Western philosophy since then has been a response and a dialogue to his work. He believed that only thought proved existence. His most famous quote is, I think, therefore I am. Therefore, Descartes concluded, if he doubted his own existence, then something or someone must be doing the doubting. Therefore, the very fact that he doubted his existence 
proved his existence. From Italy, the Italian Renaissance spread north, first by merchants from northern Europe, then by the exodus of Renaissance artists after the French invasion of Italy in 1494 and the sack of Rome in 1527 by Germanic troops. These artists spread Renaissance values and techniques throughout Europe, and northern Europe soon began producing masterworks unique to the area. Among these were the German Albrecht Dürer, who produced fantastically detailed engravings and woodcuts, often of religious subjects, and Flemish artists like Jan van Eyck, who painted ordinary people and popularized oil paints, and Peter Bruegel, who also painted ordinary people, but who specialized in crowds and large numbers of people. We will continue our study of week two in the next lecture. Thank you.